So, enough of that. We know how to do that service pretty much. So I'd like to go back to talking about, uh, I'd like to talk more generally about what's going on here, about this book, about the services as they come to us in the Byzantine Rite, and where we're going with this today. Um, as I said, prayer for the dead goes back to the Old Testament. We hear the book of Maccabees. We hear about offerings for the dead so that they can be freed from punishment. And we know from the history of Jewish prayer that this was, this was something significant. They did not look, because the resurrection was a theological opinion for the Jews, it wasn't a major part of their tradition. And you'll find that Jews look on cemeteries, for example, very differently from the way Christians do. In our tradition, we have prayers for the dead going back to probably the year, the, the early 4th century, maybe the late 3rd, 300s, 400s, 300s at least. One of the earliest prayers that we have is, O oh God, spirits and all flesh. And in the Barberini Codex, one of the earliest liturgical books in Greek, it has prayers. It has a prayer for the dead, another prayer for the dead, a prayer for a priest who's died, a prayer for a man who's died. <laughs> Prayers of consolation for those who have been left behind, for mourners. All important because the funeral services are important for the deceased. Our prayer makes a difference. They are also important for the survivors and for the community. We have to pray for those who have died. We have to pray for the people they left behind and for ourselves. And this is absolutely an essential part of our services. But we don't actually have a written out funeral service until sometime in the 9th century, until the 800s. We don't have a manuscript that says, and then the priest does this, and then the people sing this, and so on. We just have prayers, probably because everybody knew how the services go. When they're finally written down, rather before, sorry, before they're written down, we do know from accounts, for example, we have uh, the story, uh, some writings about the death of Saint Macrina, and then we, you know, and then the candles were lit, and then we sang psalms, and then we took her out and buried her. From those sorts of accounts, we do know that there, that people were buried within a couple of days of death, quite reasonably, because without involvement, you have to. There was often an all-night vigil, and the early Christians, partly because of persecutions, but even after, they <coughs> loved night vigils. They'd come together and pray in the evening. And we know that very often people would gather in the evening. They would pray for the, by the body of the person who died through the night. They would keep vigil with them. In the morning, they'd say some more prayers. They might celebrate the liturgy either in church or in the cemetery. And then by the 400s, a book called the Apostolic Constitutions, we know even then that people were saying, and then on the third day, and the ninth day, and the 40th day after death, you should celebrate the Eucharist for them or have prayers. And every year thereafter, and that is how we remember our dead. But the bigger kind of remembrance that's also critical to remember here, to keep in mind, is that it is God's memory of the departed that we're praying for. Even those that have been forgotten by all human beings now living, we pray for and we ask God to remember them eternally. Our memory is not eternal. God says. So please remember, we are working together, begging God for those who have died, for the survivors, and for God's memory and care for the repose. And this is important. We really believe it makes a difference. The church has always spent time on these prayers. She wouldn't have done that if it didn't matter. Now, in addition to the funeral service, the prayer the church provided for commemorations of the dead. As I mentioned, the Apostolic Constitution said, every year thereafter, remember the dead. In the text of the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, we remember the dead. Where is that? Where are, the where are the prayers in every divine liturgy for the dead? Well, in the Anaphora, in the Eucharistic prayer, after the consecration, the body and blood of Christ are present on the altar, and we pray for whom? Apostles, martyrs, and 
the martyrs were considered the, the, the classic case of the saints, going back to the Acts of the Apostles, those who died and witnessed Mr. Christ, who knew they were in heaven. But all the class of the saints and confessors, every just spirit made perfect in the faith. Think about that. In every divine liturgy, we are praying for all the saints and all the dead together at once. The communion of saints means that it's not the saints over here and all the schmoes over here and then us. There is a communion. And so the church, since the beginning, has remembered the dead with the saints, the apostles, the martyrs, and all the saints from the very beginning toward the end of the divine liturgy. And then later, when the church hymns, the Troparia and Kentucky and such, were divided into eight tones, credited to St. John Damascene, we find that certain days of the week are set aside to remember the saints, particularly the martyrs, and all the departed. And what day of the week is that? Saturday. Okay. Saturday. This, and this is something, by the way, brief aside, this is something as cantors, this is a part of liturgy that you should be familiar with. On Monday, we pray in honor of the, we sing in honor of the holy angels. On Tuesday, John the Baptist. On Wednesday, the cross and the mother of God. On Thursday, the apostles and St. Nicholas. On Friday, the cross again. On Saturday, we pray for the martyrs, more generally for all the saints. We pray for all the departed. We also pray for monastics, for monks and nuns, because they were considered to have died to the world when they put on the habit. So those groups of prayers, since, since the middle of the first millennium, Saturday was a day that we prayed for the dead. And those hymns were set, and we still use those today. If you look in the Green Book on the prayers for Saturday, that's what you'll find. So... <coughs> Where else in the course of the year do we sing hymns for the dead? Well, how many people here have used the new Presanctified books? A fair number of people. In the hymns, the Stichira, for, set for Friday evening, in the tone of the week, there is a hymn in each tone for the dead. Because in the Byzantine Rite, when does our church day begin? In the evening, sundown. So on Friday night, it's already Saturday. It's already the day we pray for the dead. And that's why at the Presanctified, we have those eight hymns in the Bolhar melodies, which we also sing at the funeral, because it's Saturday. But it wasn't, as I said, it wasn't until about the 10th century that we actually have a written out book in hand that says, here's how we do a funeral. And by then, it's already, a minute, it's already included into the structure of matins, because the first funeral service that we have is for monks. And monks, on, we're celebrating morning prayer every day. So I would like to hand these out, and we will look at where our funeral service comes from and the parts of it. Some you will, most you will recognize. But one problem with our current funeral book, if you could. as with any service, is that we can get caught in the weeds of leading the service. We can say, what comes, yes? We can get caught in the weeds of the service, oh my gosh, what comes next? And one of the reasons that I wanted to do this class today, as soon as we had the new Parastas book, is because nothing quite matches the look of terror that I have seen on Cantor's faces at funerals when they're saying, where am I? Okay. And as we'll see, that has two reasons. One of them is our services. The service is a little complicated. The book, which mixes the text with music and the text without music and doubles everything, is a little more complicated. Plus the fact that every parish has abbreviated or done the service a little bit different. 
And there is nothing wrong with the pastor adapting the service locally when appropriate for pastoral reasons. But it can leave canders just trying to find the next thing to sing. And then the funny thing is, once they start singing, very often the people will start singing because they know where it goes. They need a leader. But it does mean the canter may be the person who's least able in the church to say, oh, I know where I am. And that's why I wanted to look at the service today. On the left is the order of daily matins. How many people here have been at matins, if not in your parishes, at Uniontown or somewhere else? How many people have been to Paschal Matins on Easter? Okay, that's really different. Paschal Matins is a whole other kettle of fish. How many people have been Matins at Good, for Good Friday, the 12 Gospels? It's a lot closer to this, more complicated. This is basic daily monastic Matins, parish Matins. Let's look at what's here. And then compare it with the burial service on the right. In daily matins, we start out with a part that's usually omitted where we pray for the civil authorities and the founders of the church. Whereas in the burial service, well, if we're going to bury a body, we have to have a body. So we bring the body into church. And when we bring the body into church, what do we sing? Amen. Holy God. We know that that is a processional hymn of the Byzantine rite going back to the 300s. We have records of, you know, we go on a procession, one of the things we sing is Holy God. And so we sing it as a procession when we bring the body in. There, may, there will often be a reading of the Holy Gospel, because it is the Gospel that has the message of resurrection, which we need to hear. There is a tendency sometimes among Christians, even to this day, to imagine that once someone's soul is in heaven, that's the end of the story. But we were not meant to have our soul separated from our bodies. Death is a catastrophe. Death is inherently unnatural. We as human beings are made up of body and soul. As we say in one of the hymns, you fashioned me, a composite creature. I'm made out of two different things melded together. And we have to remember that we pray for the rest, the repose of the departed, and beyond that is the resurrection. So I would ask you as cantors, listen for the priest to talk about resurrection, both Christ and our own. Because it's the Paschal mystery, Christ dying and rising again, and our incorporation into that, that takes us forward. So, we bring the body in, we sing Holy God, there's a blessing, which is a little different. At, at, the, at the funeral, we use the regular blessing for all of the sacraments, blessed is our God. And then at Matins, where there would normally be some six psalms, often abbreviated, but six morning psalms, we sing just one psalm, Psalm 90. And in the very first service, very first funeral book that we have that mentions lay people, it says, for lay people, we sing six psalms. For a monk, we do Psalm 90. Now we do Psalm 90 for everybody. Why? What, what is in Psalm 90? that's relevant to the funeral service. Well, if you look at the text, and this is why I say read the text in front of you. The church's prayers mean something. Psalm 90 talks about God's protection. Psalm 90 talks about God watching over His faithful ones. The one who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides in the shadow of God of heaven. He says to the Lord, and we're imagining the person who has died saying this, you are my protector, my God in whom I trust. It's God who will snare him, who will free you from the snare of the fowler who seeks to destroy you. You will not fear the terror of the night. And so on. This is a prayer of someone on a difficult journey saying, I trust that God will protect me. This is what we sing at the beginning of the burial service, the funeral service. And then in place of the regular great litany, we have a great litany for the deceased. And the great litany is the one that be, the litany of peace and peace, let us pray to the Lord, with petitions for the deceased. And then at Matins, on almost every day of the week, we sing, the Lord is God has revealed himself to us. But on Saturdays and on penance days and at the funeral service, we sing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia with some verses. That's a victory song. 
That's a praise of God. And it kind of freaks some people out that we're singing hallelujah when someone has died. But that's for two reasons. One of them is we believe in the resurrection. And one of them is this is a person who has completed their mortal life. Hopefully they have died in the faith. And they have died in a state of grace. But the very fact that they are here in church being buried, and that's why not having a church burial has been historically a big deal. The church has said, okay, this is someone who got to the end. And this itself is, is a good thing, even though it's terrible that they've died. So we sing the Alleluia, or the Lord is God, in the melody of the next Treparian. It's always followed by a Treparian that follows it. So, for example, um, on a day when the Treparian was in tone four, we'd sing... The Lord is, uh, it, uh, no, sometimes it, the Lord is God and has revealed himself to us. But on the other, but when we sing the Alleluia at a funeral, what's the very first Treparian that we sing? In the depth of your wisdom, O only creator. Or the older version, if you sing that now, that means we're going to sing Alleluia the same way. Alleluia, Alleluia, and so on. And the, de the deacon or the priest chants the verses. At Matins, the deacon always takes these verses. And we're done with the Alleluia. Now we're going to have some psalms. In Matins, you have a bunch of psalms, which are often omitted because that's why Matins can take an hour and a half. And if you're a monk, that's fine. In your parish, you won't do that. These are normally skipped. But on Saturday, we ch and at the funeral service, we chant Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is the longest psalm in the 150 psalms of David. 176 verses. It's about God's law. It's about God teaching us his law and the gift of God showing us how to live. So we sing a selection. We sing one-tenth of that psalm at the funeral service. Okay, 12, 12 verses or 18 verses with refrains. We call those stations. Station means you stand. And then those stations are followed at the, at, later on by sidalni or sessional hymns. Sessional means sitting. So, we st so at Matins, we would stand for the psalms, we would sit for some hymns, do this three times. On Sunday, we sing some special hymns or blessings called Evlo Vitaria for the resurrection about the choirs of angels and the murmuring women. But at the funeral service, we sing some hymns for the departed. So after singing the stations, and those are the parts that go, for example, they are happy whose life is blameless, who follow God's law. Blessed are you, O Lord. Now that's Psalm 118. That's all from Psalm 118. And then the second station, Save me, for I am yours, O Savior. Save the soul of your servant. And that's a Christian insertion into Psalm 118. So we all know about that part. And then the blessings, the Evlogitaria, are the choir of saints has found the fountain of life. And the gate to paradise. So you all know that, right? You've all heard that. <clears throat> then we have Psalm 50, Psalm of a hymn of repentance. And then we have something called the canon, and the canon is just a part of Matthew's in the Byzantine Rite. It's not part of any other rite of the church. It's a long poem. It takes a bit of the Old Testament, and then it tells us how Christians look at that bit of the Old Testament. And then it does it again. It does it eight or nine times. These are called odes. And then after three odes, we stick in some hymns. And in other three odes, we stick in some hymns. And at the end, we sing to the Mother of God, and that's the canon. And for the funeral service, Saint, uh, 
The, uh, we actually have, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit more in, in a minute. We have two canons that come into play here. Um, then after that we have a part where suddenly we switch gears entirely. If you look on the left, from Psalm 148 to the end, that's completely different from the burial service. Why is that? Because we're here for a funeral. It's time to do something different. We sing some hymns for the departed, the hymns of St. John Damascene, the Stichira of St. John Damascene, which are all about the vanity of life and the fact that this passes and the things of God endure. But we follow that up with the Beatitudes from the Gospel. We talk about God's blessings for mourners, for peacemakers, different kinds of people and the way that God blesses them. Okay. It is important to recognize that the funeral service is going to be a time of sadness. It is true that Christians, St. Paul tells us, should not be overly mournful because they should recognize this person is alive to God. It's possible to overdo this in either direction. It's possible to tell people who are weeping that they shouldn't without recognizing that Jesus said, blessed are you who mourn. It's not a problem to mourn at the right time. On the other hand, any funeral service that acts as if that person is dead, gone, and will never exist again is not a Christian funeral service. <coughs> we have to keep that in mind. And that's one reason that these are followed by readings, St. Patinus of the Divine Liturgy, a Prochemenon, an apostolic reading, and that's a phrase that's used in our books these days instead of epistle. Okay? Why is that? Well, it's not always an epistle. During the Easter season, what book do we read from at the, at the Mass of the Divine Liturgy? I heard it from somebody. Yeah. Acts of the Apostles. That's not an epistle, but it is a writing of the apostles. In fact, our, our book in Slavonic that has these readings is called the Apostol. So that's, it's a new term for us, but it means just, just what it should. And then an Alleluia in the Gospel. And then a litany for the deceased. Then we come up normally, kiss the cross, make our last farewells as some hymns are sung. And by the way, the hymns that are sung, or the melody that's sung, <coughs> is the same melody that's associated with the burial service for Christ on Holy Saturday. And, at, and on Good Friday, when from the tree Joseph of Arimathea took your body down from the cross and wrapped it in linen, this is the melody that we use when we're singing the hymns for the departed whom we have taken and washed and dressed and prepared to bury, looking forward to the resurrection. This is important. It's critical. And these, the reason some of these hymns were chosen is precisely to emphasize that. We lose this too easily. And then after that, we have an extended conclusion for the service. And that conclusion consists of the Trisagion prayers. That's the part of their usual beginning prayers that begin with Holy God. Question, how many people have seen the prayers at the beginning of this book, before the service, before the liturgy? If you open those up, you will find that they begin with Heavenly King Comforter, Spirit of Truth, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Glory, Most Holy Trinity, Lord have mercy, Glory, Our Father, for thine is the kingdom. Those are our usual beginning prayers. Every service, practically, begins or could begin with those prayers along with our, the daily morning prayers and evening prayers in the Byzantine Rite. As a cantor, you should know those prayers. And I'll take a second aside here. If, as a cantor, you are not praying every day, start tonight. It's something that many of us can fall out of the habit of. I'm singing in church. As 
Christians, we should always pray every day. In gratitude, in petition, in penitence, we should remember God throughout the day. We should pray every day. If you're not praying, start with those prayers. But by the time you get to the service, what I'm, what I'm really getting to is, this is well-known stuff. We have that, and then some traparia for the dead, and then a litany, and then a prayer of oh God's spirits in all flesh. And that's precisely what we just said. That's our, pun, that's our short panahita, and I'll explain it in a minute while I say short. And then there's, if you look on the left, one more time, I said we kind of jumped out of the track for mountains. What's the next to last thing? Right before the dismissal, there's a blessing of the people by the priest. What happens at the funeral service? We have a blessing of the body and a prayer for forgiveness of their sins before we take them out of church. Matins, the funeral service, there is a very, very close parallel. Byzantine right Christians, we like to take a service and do everything we can with it. That's where we got the funeral. We took matins. And we took the funeral prayers and put them in in various places and added hymns, and that's our service. Okay. Now, very few of you will celebrate Mass on a regular basis. But it really helps when you're looking at the funeral service, whether in this book or any other book, to say, oh, okay, I'm progressing through an order of service. These aren't just stuck in an order that made sense to somebody. They're part of our tradition. Now, one more thing I'd like you to look at. If you have a pen, go back and take the part that goes from Psalm 90 up to, O Savior, give rest to your servant, and put a bracket around it on one side. And we're going to refer to that later as part one of the funeral. And then we start again with Psalm 50, and we go to the end of the canon with a small litany for the deceased. We're going to call that later part two. And if you don't have a pen, don't worry about it. But the two psalms, Psalm 90 and Psalm 50, start a chunk of the service, and that becomes important later on. Any questions? Yes? Where did the second part end? Uh, the, the, the small litany for the deceased. Just Psalm 50 and the canon. So the hymns of St. John Damascene are the next part. So ended before the hymns of St. John Damascene. Okay. We don't have new funeral books, but that, that matches what's in here. If you look at it, with one exception, if you try to find the funeral service, if you go through the funeral service, <coughs> you will find that the sessional hymn, O Savior, Give Rest to Your Departed, on page 82, and then it goes immediately to the hymns of St. John Damascene. In other words, a whole chunk of the funeral service is not in this book. And in the next, in, uh, we're going to take a short break. There's coffee at the other end of the hall. Get up and stretch, use the restroom, get a drink. And we'll talk some more about why this book doesn't match what you have in front of you.